Hello guys, we're back for another lecture in the Discord Clinical Microbiology series. This is actually a re-recording because unfortunately the live version of recording had picture quality issues and rather than spend all day trying to fix it, I just decided to re-record it. Um, you guys will also notice that there was a lecture two, this is actually lecture three. Um, lecture two, we ended up reformatting it, so the materials that we saw on that uh, unit we will just see further down in the lecture series. Um, unfortunately, we realized that people are not so interested in the individual characteristics of the different microbes, so we're just going to try to refocus on the diseases instead of just looking at the individual organisms. So for today's lecture, we're actually going to see two different topics. Uh, we're going to be talking about normal flora, and then we will see an overview of the respiratory tract bacterial infections. For part A of this lecture, which is normal flora, we will be focusing on the finding, commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism. And we will look at the sterile podocytes as well as places where the normal flora is more likely to be found in large quantities. So let's get started. First and foremost, why is normal flora so important? On the first original lecture, one of our users sent primary literature supporting that the number of bacterial to human cells in the body is closer to a one-to-one -one relation instead of 10 times more. My data, unfortunately, is a bit older than that, but this figure still tells us about the abundance of microbes actually living in your body. Because of our close relation with it, it's important to distinguish between those that are normal flora, those that are pathogenic, and those that be normal flora may become pathogenic under the right circumstances. As clinical scientists, we need to have a deep understanding of the flora at each body site so that we're able to determine the clinical significance of our findings in the bench. So let's look over some definitions. Commensalism is when an organism lives in, on, or with another one without causing it damage. Mutualism is described by the peaceful and profitable coexistence between two organisms. Parasitism is defined by the ability of an organism to cause harm or disease in the host. I have found that over time, we, we discover how organisms uh, vary in their role in our body. Sometimes organisms may be commensal, sometimes they may, they may be uh, mutual, and sometimes they may become parasites. And this is all a very de delicate ecosystem that we're looking at. As I mentioned, the host micro relation is a very delicate one, and we are only scratching the surface when it comes to understanding the many intricacies associated with it. With that being said, commensal bacteria is ubiquitous, meaning that it is found in most places. However, they do tend to prefer places that are warm and moist, such as the groin and, arm and armpit areas. These bacteria are commonly associated with body odor in said places. Another place where bacteria is commonly found is the gut. You may have heard about probiotics and gut microbiome before. The bacteria that call your gut their home are part of a delicate balance. They help you, the host, by producing vitamins such as folic acid, vitamin K, and biotin. They also help protect you from pathogenic bacteria or from your own normal flora becoming pathogenic through mechanisms of competitive exclusion. This means they outcompete the other organisms by taking up space, consuming the nutrients, and even producing toxins that act against the invaders. A common example of this delicate balance can be found in the female vagina, where Lactobacillus acidophilus maintains the balance and prevents Gardnerella vaginalis, another normal flora bacteria, from causing the disease bacterial vaginosis. When the balance is skewed, the populations of lact Lactobacillus are depleted due to antimicrobial therapy or other factors. Gardnerella is able to take over the environment and cause disease. We will now be going into detail and extensively examine all the normal flora since we are constrained in time and it is out of the scope of this lecture. However, I do want to point out some of the most common places in organisms found. You are probably familiar with the staphs and, and streps, which are commonly hosted in the skin and mouth, respectively. Furthermore, you have also probably heard of E. coli, which thrives in your GI tract, as I mentioned in the previous slide, like the bacillus in the female genital tract. As it is important to know 
of the normal flora for each site, it is also critical to know which sites are sterile, meaning that nothing should be growing or colonizing it. Invasion of sterile sites is usually accompanied by severe and dangerous clinical manifestations and diseases such as bacteremias, meningitis, cystitis, and others. Finding bacteria growing in solid organ biopsy, blood culture, CSF, lower respiratory tract cultures, and urine cultures is usually the, co the cause for concern and needs to be examined carefully to determine if the results are due to contamination during specimen collection or genuine infection. The clinical laboratory scientist relies on their knowledge of the normal flora, collection procedures, repeated cultures, and extensive protocols to report accurate, significant, and reliable results to the physicians. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes bacteria can become problematic if it gets into places where it should not be. This is the case of nosocomial infections, which are hospital-acquired infections, and usually this will happen when organisms from a healthcare worker will come into contact and colonize a patient who might be immunocompromised or sick or has an open wound or an open surgery wound. Uh, this is uh, the other type of infection would be endogenous infections where the organisms found in the host itself just gain entry to a place where it should not be found. Examples of this type of infection are burn infections, bacteremias, and respiratory infections. And that brings us to the conclusion of the first part of this lecture, which was about normal flora. The second part of this lecture is going to focus on respiratory tract infections, and we will be looking at understanding the mechanical defenses of the respiratory tract. And we want to also identify the anatomy of the respiratory tract and associate symptoms with infections. So let's take a look at the anatomy of the respiratory tract. We can generally divide this into the upper respiratory tract where your nasal cavity, your pharynx, and your larynx are found, and your lower respiratory tract, which is where the trachea, bronchi, and bronchioles are found. The types of diseases that are associated with the respiratory tract can generally be divided into upper respiratory tract infections and lower respiratory tract infections, and we will be looking at those in more detail in the next slides. Your respiratory tract is designed to protect you against infections, from your nasal hairs to the convoluted passages that the bacteria need, must navigate, to the mucous membranes, to the secretions, the cilia, reflexes such as coughing, sneezing, swallowing, and the normal flora, which through competitive exclusion prevents pathogens from settling in, all work synergistically to help you stay healthy. However, just as your system is designed to protect you, bacteria have also evolved different virulence factors which allow them to circumvent these different adaptations and allow them to settle in. Some of these factors are their adherence, toxins they produce, which may clear the normal flora, growth factors, uh, methods to evade the, the host immune system, such as capsules, and multiplication within host cells. There are some organisms which are considered to always be pathogenic, and these are all what we call critical results. Uh, normal organisms found in this category are Corynebacterium diphtheriae, which causes diphtheria, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is the agent of tuberculosis, Mycoplasma pneumonia, which is the causative agent of um, pneumonia in young adults, Chlamydia trachomatis, which causes chlamydia, chlamydia pneumonia, Bordetella pertussis, which causes the whooping cough, Legionella species, which causes Legionnaire's disease, and Nocardia species. Other organisms that are less likely to be found, but dangerous as well, are Francisella tularensis, Bacillus anthracis, Jersinia pestis, Coxilla burnetti, Brucella species, Pastorella multocida, Chlamydia pestici, and Legionella pneumophila. The reason why these organisms are considered more dangerous is because they are also classified as agents of bioterror, and if they are found in the specimen, they must be reported appropriately to the authorities uh, just because of the risk associated with um, bioterror warfare. So as we mentioned briefly before, 
you will divide your infections in your upper and lower respiratory tract. Your upper respiratory tract infections are laryngitis, laryngotracheal bronchitis, epiglottitis, pharyngitis, tonsillitis, rhinitis, and stomatitis. Your lower respiratory tract infections are your bronchitis and your pneumonia. We will look into more detail into these different infections uh, briefly. So for your upper respiratory tract infections, um, we have the big five, or actually six, because I put pharyngitis and tonsillitis together just because they kind of have the same descriptions. But um, let's just get started here. So your laryngitis is usually a common, associated with a common cold or flu. It is usually viral and benign. And it is characterized by hoarseness in your throat. However, if you do see an exudate or a membrane is present, then these are indicatives of streptococcus or diphtheria infections. Now, for your pharyngitis and tonsillitis, these are common in the colder months, usually also viral, and they are characterized by exudates, vesicles, and vessel ulcerations or swollen lymph nodes. And if bacterial, the common culprit is usually strep pyogenes. Now, for laryngotracheal bronchitis, say that three times fast, is actually more common in younger children. It is characterized by fever, difficulty breathing, hoarseness, barking, and non-productive cough. And again, it is also usually viral, but it'll occasionally be bacterial. And in those cases, the common suspect is usually mycoplasma pneumoniae. For epiglottitis, this is more common in children 2 to 6 years of age. It is characterized by fever, difficulty swallowing, drooling, and respiratory obstruction. It is usually bacterial in nature, and the common suspects are uh, haemophilus influenza, streptococci, streptococci, and staphylococci. Lastly, we have rhinitis, which is an inflammation of the nasal mucosa, and this infection is almost always a viral infection. Now the lumbar respiratory tract is a bit more straightforward when it comes to the different types of infections. We have bronchitis and pneumonia, but we do break down these two diseases into different categories depending on their manifestation. For bronchitis, we can have either acute or chronic bronchitis. The definition of an acute bronchitis is just excessive fluid accumulation, variable cough, fever, sputum, and croup, and the bronchial epithelium is disturbed. Now, for you to have a chronic bronchitis, you must have coughing or sputum most days during at least three months for two consecutive years. For the usual suspects, as I like to call them for bronchitis, we have Bordetella pertussis, Bordetella parapertussis, Haemophilus influenza, Mycoplasma pneumoniae, and Chlamydia pneumoniae. Now, pneumonia is a bit more complicated when it comes to the different categories. It is, uh, it is characterized by fever, chills, chest pains, cough, and other nonspecific symptoms, which makes it hard to be diagnosed. And we break it down into community-acquired pneumonia, which is CAP, or hospital-acquired pneumonia, HAP. The CAP uh, category is age-dependent, meaning that the organisms associated with it are going to be stratified by age. For example, neonates will usually be afflicted by COVID-19, pneumocystis scarini, whereas infants will usually be affected by viral infections, Children, hemophilus influenza, strep pneumonia, staph aureus, and young adults will usually be affected by mycoplasma pneumonia, viral, or chlamydia pneumonia. In the hospital acquired category, we have non ICU, which is H influenza, aerobic GNR, Legionella species, staph aureus, C pneumonia, and then in the ICU category, Legionella gram negative rods and mycoplasma pneumonia. What this tells us is that it is very important to look at not just the specimen type, but also the patient age when we're looking at different um, cultures just to assess the significance of our findings. Now, for 
An additional category is the chronic lower respiratory tract infections, and these are associated with patients who have pre-existing conditions, uh, conditions such as cystic fibrosis or immunocompromised states. Now, the usual suspects in this type of infections are mycobacterium tuberculosis, fungal infections, anaerobes, actinomyces, nocardias, or mycobacterium other than tuberculosis. In patients with cystic fibrosis, we usually see infections that are caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosus, Staph aureus, H. influenza, Microdaria cetacea. And then infections in immunocompromised patients in general, we will usually be looking at malignancy caused infections, tuberculosis, mycobacterium ovium, strep pneumonia, haemophilus influenza, nocardia rhodococcus, or Legionella. And lastly, here we have my final summary of everything that we have talked about here in the different respiratory infections. Unfortunately, because I am including it as a slide as a part of the re recording, um, I cannot really zoom in into the different categories. However, this is uploaded into the lecture materials folder, which is accessible through the lecture library on our Discord server. So, if you would like to download it and use it for yourself, uh, for studying or for memorizing the different organisms that are associated with the different types of diseases, you're more than welcome to. And this brings us to the conclusion of our lecture. I would like to thank you guys for sticking with me. Uh, you guys can find me at Discord GG slash biology. I am Lali or Lleo. And once again, all this content is created using my undergraduate and graduate notes. Thank you and have a great day.